Good morning, everyone. As you're joining, we're going to wait a minute here to get started. Welcome to Friday. We'll give everybody a chance for, for late people to jump on. I hope everyone's had a good pollinator week, hence the uh, blossoms in the background. Remember when bloom was so good this year? Um, it was a great year for bloom. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, every, welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Tom Duvall. I'm the Senior Manager for Field Out Outreach and Education um, with the Almond Board. Um, I'm very excited to, to have the fifth day of activity for Pollinator Week. And today we're gonna have a great webinar really outlining the Bee Friendly Farming um, Program um, and the Bee Plus Scholarship um, opportunity that um, Josette will be jumping into later. Um, the Bee Friendly um, Farming Program is a great um, process to get certified um, as a Bee Friendly Farm. I, we think this is really going to be a great thing for market um, to communicate out to the public what we're doing um, with bees, to be good stewards of the bees and good hosts for the bees. And I think today we're going to have some really good talks to kind of outline that. Um, so with that, let's um, go and look at the agenda for today. Josette, if you want to forward. Are we? Should One more slide, Josette. There we go. There we go. So um, kicking it off today, um, Josette Lewis is is um, a, a fellow person at the Almond Board. She's going to dive into the B Plus Scholarship Program. Um, this is a great opportunity that we're announcing for growers to really help participate um, in these other different um, program areas. Then um, Isaac Lyle from um, Pollination Partnership is really gonna dig into what the Bee Friendly Farm is and what the certification program is. Uh, following up on that, Eric um, Harris from Sure Harvest is gonna walk through the steps within CASP, within the California Almond Sustainability Program, the process to walk through on how to apply um, to be a bee friendly farm and and the process to get certified for that um, then billy sink from apism is going to um, cover the seeds for bees program and then lastly to finish us off um, um, chris um, Rishwain from um, i think he's stanislaus area uh, blue diamond grower is um, going to share um, his perspective as a farmer, I'm really excited to hear that. Um, kind of the boots on the ground is something near and dear to my heart. And to see what he's doing with this in the field, I think is going to be the great um, finishing off um, talk today. So a couple of things on doing a webinar. Um, if Jose moves forward here, um, a couple of tips on this. If you mouse over your screen, you'll see this menu bar pop up. And a couple of things there, everybody that came in were muted. So if we ask everybody to keep their mics off, it just keeps distractions and noise um, down in the background. Also with video, um, we'd love to see everybody's faces, but um, if you keep your video off, it'll help with bandwidth um, with the talk. And lastly, for questions, there's a chat box and you can see the arrow pointing to that little chat icon there. Um, at the end, we'll open it up to questions and you can click that box and a little chat window will come up and you can add questions. You can also add questions during the talk in and um, we'll hold those to the end and pull those back up and cover those. So if, if something piques your interest during a talk, go ahead and put the question and we'll just save it for the end. So with that, I want to introduce Josette Lewis. She leads up our um, science and research within the almond board and it's a very principal part of the um, of the B efforts within the board. So with that, um, Josette. Thanks. Well, before I get to talk about the free stuff, I just wanted to remind folks about 
the Honeybee Best Management Practice Guide uh, that the Almond Board puts out. Uh, if you've participated in some of our training events and in the orchard events in the spring, we often do trainings around the bee best management practices during bloom time. Um, hopefully you've got uh, trees laden heavy this year with nuts, reminding us how important that pollination is because it's why we have such a great uh, looks like it's going to be a great yield this year. So if you have, if you don't have a copy of them and you'd like to get one, um, uh, definitely get in touch with us. Um, a really useful, very practical guide on what growers need to do, what uh, discussions they need to have with the beekeepers that they or bee brokers they rent hives from, uh, communication with PCAs or pesticide applicators as well. So really uh, pragmatic and easy to digest guide on bee best management practices. So make sure you have a copy of that as a foundation. But I get the job, it's probably as fun, most fun in this webinar because I get to talk about the free stuff. So um, we recognize that um, this is a new opportunity, and as Tom mentioned, the Bee Friendly Farming Certification is very much a market-oriented um, label, and so it's something you can put on your products and put on your farm and use in your market communications. Um, and as we know, there are um, very valuable segments of our market for almonds that really care about how almonds are grown. So this is a great way for you to get credit in the marketplace for the good work that you do on your farm. And to make it uh, even easier for growers, we're announcing this week the B Plus Scholarship. So this is a great way to try some new things because we will um, defray some of the cost of trying new things. So I hope as you listen to um, the talks that follow, you can see how you can take advantage of um, the two components of the scholarship. Um, so let me just say, we're, we're going to sponsor this for the first 100 growers. Uh, you must participate in TAS, the California Almond Sustainability Program. So if you're already in there, you've probably gotten 90% of the way. Um, and uh, we're very happy to pay for the, the last 10% um, or the last 50% if that's where you are in CASP um, in terms of the requirements to become a bee-friendly farm. So once you're in CAS, if you're not in there now, you can definitely register and still participate. We will cover the cost of the Bee Friendly Farming registration and a beautiful new farm sign that uh, Pollinator Partnership has just put out. And in addition, we will cover up to $2,000 of free cover crop seed from Project APSM's Seeds for Bees program. So you'll hear from Isaac on the Bee Friendly Farming. You'll hear from Eric on how to apply through CAST to make it even easier. And then uh, you can hear from Billy on how to take advantage of that cover crop seed, which is one of the components of bee friendly farming. So um, again, a great opportunity to try something new because we'll help defray the cost. And we hope that this will be a big success and we'll do it again perhaps in future years. So make sure you're right. one of those first hundred growers. And I will now turn it over, I believe, to Isaac. Hi, everyone. Uh, Josette, if you could go to the next slide. Um, On its way. All right. Yeah, so I'm Isaac. I'm with Pollinator Partnership, and I'm specifically working on our Bee Friendly Farming team. Um, Bee Friendly Farming is a program from Pollinator Partnership, the world's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to the protection and promotion of pollinators and their ecosystems. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so Be Friendly okay. Farming is a certification program that provides guidelines for farmers interested in promoting pollinator health on their lands. And 
these guy oh back one <laughs> these guidelines serve as a checklist for responsible practices to protect pollinators and their ecosystems they include things like providing arm farm habitat and floral resources um, and for growers it's really about making positive incremental changes on your farm to support healthy pollinators and you'll find that it's affordable and simple and that it's science-based sustainable guidelines make your farm and products stand out to customers as Josette described. Um, next. So under the Bee Friendly Farming Program, there are currently about 800 bee friendly farms. Um, and it's a global program. It's predominantly in the United States. It was started here in California, um, but we also have several members in Canada and even now across the world. Um, and these certified farms are an essential part of keeping our pollinators healthy and food supply abundant. Um, and the acreage set aside for pollinators is really critical for their health. Next slide. So what are the bee friendly farming certification criteria? Oh, well, the first is to offer forage providing good nutrition for bees on at least 3% of land. And this forage can be temporary, including the crops themselves and also cover crops. Uh, we also ask that farmers provide bloom throughout the growing season, especially in the early spring and the late autumn. Those are two critical times for bee species. Uh, we also require that they provide clean water for bees, assuming that they're not inhibited by any kind of government mandated water restriction. Um, and we require that they provide sustain suitable nesting habitat through features uh, such as hedgerows, natural brush, buffer strips, or even some bare ground. Um, and then finally, we require that they practice integrated pest management, reducing or even eliminating the use of chemicals. Um, and there's an annual certification fee of just $45, um, both for the certification application and then uh, annually to remain in good standing with the program. Next. So why get involved? Um, well, as, as we've kind of discussed, uh, by becoming a bee-friendly farm, you can help preserve and protect the pollinator population by implementing positive incremental changes on your farm. Uh, BFF helps farmers incorporate affordable, simple science-based guidelines like offering nutrition and habitat for bees and integrated pest management strategies. Um, and as a certified farm, your products will stand out to consumers and you'll be an essential part of keeping our pollinators healthy and food supply abundant. Um, you'll also receive access to the Bee Friendly Farming logo uh, to market your sustainability efforts. Um, Joseph, <laughs> go back just one slide. Uh, and in addition to the Bee Friendly Farming logo, you'll see some increased profits. Uh, we find that consumers are often willing to pay a premium for sustainably farmed products. And you'll also enjoy exclusive access to the Bee Friendly Farming store and Bee Friendly Farming merchandise, including hats and metal signs, um, rat cards, and some other materials. Next slide. Uh, back one. There we go. Um, you also get to join and be a part of the community of like-minded growers from around the world. Be one of these 800 growers, 800 plus growers now. Um, and you receive monthly Bee Friendly Farming newsletters to stay connected with that community uh, with relevant news and technical guides. Um, and you also receive some increased publicity from Pollinator Partnership. All, each of our Bee Friendly Farmers has the opportunity um, to share a guest blog post with us 
that we send out to not just the bee friendly farming community, but also the pollinator partnerships larger following to help share your story and what you're doing to support pollinators. Next slide. Um, so some great first steps to getting involved would be planting for pollinators and starting to meet some of those criteria. And Pollinator Partnership has free eco-regional planting guides, um, other technical guides and land management resources that can help start the process. Um, and then you can certify your farm by filling out the application form on our site that we'll talk about in a moment and keeping your certification up to date with those annual certification payments. Uh, you can also share your story with us to be featured on our blog and you can also always donate to support and expand the program and help other farmers implement some of these changes um, and now we're going to go to eric uh, with sure harvest thank you thank you isaac and eric uh, i want to introduce um, eric from sure harvest um, so sure harvest works with us on the casp application they they actually um work directly to create it and maintain it for us. So Eric's gonna take us through a few things with CASP. And if you've not participated in CASP, we really encourage you to. It's a great program. You'll learn a lot going through it. And you'll also be able to really demonstrate to the market that we are using sustainable practices. Um, to qualify for the Bee Friendly Farming Program, we've, we've linked the bee module and the pest module so if you complete those modules, you're el you're eligible to um, receive the um, B plus scholarship and and meet criteria of the B friendly farming. Um, and while you're in there, I really encourage you to do the rest of CASP. I think um, you'll find a, a lot of benefit for going through the um, CASP program. And with that, um, I'll pass it off to Eric. Great, thank you, Tom, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks also to everyone for participating in the webinar today. Uh, so I'm very excited to speak to you today about some new features on the CAST online platform that were introduced to support users in applying to bee friendly farming certification. And the, the slides that I'll go through um, represent kind of practical how-to of uh, using CASP to, uh, to apply. So next slide. So recent efforts by the Almond Board have helped align uh, the California Almond Sustainability Program with other uh, sustainability initiatives in part to establish the role of CASP as what we've, we're calling a sustainability translation tool that connects uh, almond-specific sustainability as it exists in the assessment modules to broader uh, sustainability programs and contexts and even uh, countries in an international way. Uh, this effort supports uh, in harmonizing the California almond industry approach to sustainability and also helps give credit uh, to cask growers for in, in many cases what they're already doing. The um, alignment, what we're talking about today, the alignment with the Pollinator Partnerships Bee Friendly Farming Certification Program is uh, one of the most recent examples of uh, these translation efforts. Next slide. So we're really pleased to make the announcement today of the updates to the CASP platform, which uh, were just introduced at the end of last week uh, to support growers with the application for bee friendly farming uh, certification. So the main steps are listed on the slide here. Uh, first is complete the bee health and pollination assessment module. Uh, for the current assessment year. Uh, and you can access that. I have the, the uh, web address for the uh, CASP website there in orange, sustainablealmondgrowing.org. Uh, once the assessment, the bee friendly or bee health and pollination module is done, then you can check a uh, report uh, in the CASP system to determine eligibility. And if one or more of your orchards are eligible, then you can upload that PDF report to the Pollinator Partnership website, uh, which is listed on the bottom of the slide. And Isaac will talk more about that part in a minute. Uh, 
Next slide. So if you haven't done so already, uh, creating a CASP online account is easy and almost instantaneous. It takes, can take less than five minutes. Uh, shown on the screen here is the main login page for the CASP website. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about creating account or other aspects of the system, uh, you can check out the, the website uh, or uh, previous CASP pre presentations through some of the Almond Board workshops on the Almond Board YouTube channel with the, the web link is shown there. Uh, for now, we'll assume you already have a CASP account and have uh, some familiarity with the, the online platform. Next slide. So the, the platform was updated so that a, a user, uh, user's eligibility for Bee Friendly Farming certification is displayed on a ban as a banner on the CASP homepage. I think, Josette, there's some uh, animations here. So if you click advance, then a red box will circle that banner. Yeah, perfect. So in, in order to determine eligibility, the first step is to complete the bee health and pollination uh, module. So this, the example here shows a user that hasn't completed the module yet. And so the message is prompting them to do so. Uh, eligibility status for the bee friendly farming program is based on the current assessment year. So if you're a CASP user who can, who's completed an assessment in a previous year, uh, one option to check your eligibility status is using the clone function or copy and paste in the system to uh, transfer your assessment from a previous year to the current year and, and then update anything as needed. So that can be done pretty quickly. Next slide. Here's an example uh, of the initial questions of the bee health and pollination module to give you a sense of what that looks like um, uh, with the initial questions referencing that bee best management practices that uh, Josette mentioned earlier. Next slide. So this example shows, I think if you advance, then the, there'll be an animation there. Um, this example shows the banner message for a user who is not not yet eligible for bee friendly farming. And in this case, it's possible to click and see uh, what's already being done and the areas that might need to change to become eligible. So next slide. So if, you, if the user clicks on that uh, banner, then you'll see a snapshot summary of uh, orchards um, that are in CASP and their status for the bee friendly farming here showing not eligible. And if you uh, click advance, maybe, uh, and one more, I think. So the, the, the large red box there shows the overall status. In this case, uh, the orchard meets all of the criteria that um, Isaac was referencing, except for bee friendly farming criterion one. Um, that criteria relates to uh, cover crops as you can see in the text there, there's reference to the Seeds for Beads program as an example to learn more about how to potentially, how to establish cover crops uh, on the farm. And then if uh, the user is interested, it's possible to look at a detailed report that gives um, all of the details of the bee friendly farming criteria, as well as the related uh, CASP assessment module questions that link to them. Next slide. And if you can, well, one more advance, we'll get the animation. So if, if orchards are eligible, the application for certification can be done very quickly in just a couple steps. So first click on the banner, then next slide. I think if you advance one more show, then, then from there, there'll be uh, the users directed to a screen here showing which uh, orchards are eligible to apply. Then it's possible to just click on the download PDF button that will give the CAS the Bee Friendly Farming Report. And I think next slide. Here's 
here, here's an example of the PDF report that's uh, generated. So um, once a user has that report, then that could be used to submit on the Pollinator Partnership uh, website. And uh, Isaac will talk about that process. So next slide. If you click twice, there will be animation. So it, I've, I've just illustrated quickly the, the steps to access for, for a CASC user to check their, oh, if you go back one, sorry. Um, for a CASC user to act, to see their bee friendly farming status and download that PDF report that's needed for uh, the pollinator partnership uh, application. Um, it's also possible to view your bee friendly farming status in other places on the site. Um, here's just showing either through the reports or progress summary. If uh, at any time there's interest in checking the bee friendly farming status or more details on the report. Okay, uh, next slide. And that's it for me. Uh, so I encourage everyone to, to log in to the CASP site, create account if you haven't done so already, and then uh, relatively easily and quickly you can um, check out your, your status to see uh, eligibility for applying for Bee Friendly Farming certification. And as Tom noted, there's a lot of other great stuff on the CASP uh, website for growers as well, uh, in addition to the Bee Friendly Farming report. Um, so, Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, and I, I'll just um, emphasize that the CAS application is very simple to use. Um, and I think um, my the area I get most excited about is there's a lot of educational benefit for going through it. Um, and and with that, we'll go back to um, Isaac to just take us through the last few steps. on, on Once you do this within CASP, um, how you can actually um, finish your application um, within the Be Friendly program in the pollination partnership. So Isaac, thank you. Yeah, thanks Tom and thanks Eric. Um, so the Bee Friendly Farming certification application um, can be found at beefriendlyfarming.org and there is a button that you can click that says get certified. Um, that should take you to a form similar to the one that you see on the screen here. And this normally takes about 40 minutes to fill out and requires some prior work gathering materials um, like photos of habitat and clean water sites, farm maps, um, perhaps a list of forage species that you've planted and some other items. Um, but with our partnership through CAST, um, CAST members should only take uh, fewer than 20 minutes even to fill out this form. Uh, we only actually require that they fill out the about you section and then of course the confirmation and payment provided that they upload uh, their PDF report that they get from CASP. Uh, next slide. So in the About You section, uh, near the bottom, similar to what we saw on Eric's slides, you want to be sure to select California Almond Sustainability Program as an existing certification that you have and then upload your CASP generated report for any qualifying orchard blocks. Um, you'll also want to be sure farther up in the about you section that the total farm acreage that you give uh, is the total acreage for all qualifying orchard blocks included on that PDF you're uploading. Um, so perhaps you have two or three orchard blocks that qualify. You have the option of either doing this form three different times and uploading a separate PDF for each of those orchards or you can upload a single PDF with information on all of the blocks. You'll just want to be sure that you make sure your total farm acreage is the acreage for all of those blocks combined. Uh, next slide. And then in the confirmation and payment section, there will be a box where you can enter in the number of qualifying orchard blocks uh, being registered, represented on that PDF report that you've uploaded. Um, and then you can select either the registration fee, which will be $45 per orchard block, 
or the second option to submit the registration fee plus an additional tax deductible donation. Um, only growers registering over 100 acres will have the option to submit that additional donation. Um, and the table that we base this recommended donation off of can be found directly below the registration form, again on dfriendlyfarming.org. And note that these fees will automatically be charged every year from the date of submission, and that currently a PayPal account is required um, in order to make the payment. And after this, the Bee Friendly Farming team will review your submission and send you a written acknowledgement letter, letter upon acceptance into the program, usually within a few weeks of receiving your submission. Next slide. Uh, for grower, oh, back one. Yeah, for growers sponsored by the Almond Board's B Plus program that Josette talked about, uh, you'll receive a unique coupon code that you can enter at the bottom of the payment section. And then where it says change, it'll say apply. And once you hit apply, the, the button changes to the word change. Um, but it will let you know whether or not your coupon code is valid, whether or not you've entered it incorrectly and it will remove the first year of the certification fee that's being covered by the Almond Board. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so as you can see, this is a really simple, easy process to go through, especially if you're a CASP member. I uh, encourage you to visit our website, BeFriendlyFarming.org, to learn some more about the program, and you can always reach out to me via email with any questions or for help navigating the registration form. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Isaac. So so now we're, we're going to jump over to the Seeds for Bees program. Um, this is pretty exciting that these um, B, B plus um, scholarship, we're going to offer up $2,000 of um, cover crop seed, which is a lot of seed that covers a lot of area. Um, and, you know, the cover crop is such a, a wonderful place for growers now. Aside from the fact that it makes for beautiful orchards, if you look at the bee habitat and the soil health benefits, it, it's such a win-win for the industry. Um, so with that, Billy Sink's going uh, from Apis M is going to share how how to um, work with the program, talk about cover crops, and how to apply for um, seeds for bees. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Billy Sink with Project Apis M. We are a nonprofit organization focused on funding and directing research throughout the country. We get our name from the Latin from, from honeybees, Apis mellifera. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why bees are in trouble, why you hear about them in the news, uh, why nutrition is important. I'm going to talk about um, why cover crops would be important to the grower in terms of pollination, why cover crops are important to the grower in terms of soil health. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the program and we're gonna uh, look at some photos and maybe talk about some research if there's time. So uh, why are bees in trouble? And it's the, we talk about the four Ps, pests, path, pathogens, pesticides, incidental pesticide use, poor nutrition, next slide. And what's really great about my work and uh, the work of forage and cover crops is that poor nutrition helps mitigate the, the other detrimental effects of those first uh, three Ps. It helps bees, um, well, it brings them more amino acids so they uh, can build antimicrobial peptides to help with their immunity and it helps them detoxify anything that they might uh, get into. Next slide, please. Um, so colonies in pollen, raised in pollen, abundant environments are always going to be much more healthy than colonies raised in pollen limited environments. Uh, the population is going to be greater. Each individual bee is going to weigh more and have uh, more fat content. Uh, each The bees communicate much more effectively and efficiently when they are raised in pollen abundant environments. So that's kind of why nutrition is so important. Next slide, please. Um, but why would, why would a, a, a grower, just besides general health and helping out bees, which many growers care about and, and, and take part in, 
uh, why would they plant cover crops? And how, how is a cover crop and that nutrition going to help that grower that year? And it's what I like to call this, this positive feedback loop. So bees in, in the first sign of spring, they are, well, when spring comes, they're looking for signs like uh, they're experiencing higher temperatures, uh, longer days, that sort of thing. But as the first uh, pollen and resources of the spring come in, that tells the colony that they've got to start increasing their numbers. The queen starts laying eggs, up to 2,000 eggs a day. And the, in three days time, those eggs uh, emerge and they start to give off a pheromone. That larvae gives off a pheromone that tells the adult bees that you've got a, a whole lot of new bees on the way. You've got to collect resources so you can feed them. So that drives the, uh, the adult workers outside of the hive to go collect more resources. And as those resources come in, they lay more eggs and that pheromone keeps increasing. But if you can start this process a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe even almost four a month before the almond bloom, when the almond bloom happens, those bees are going to just be so much more uh, vigorous and ready to go than they would have otherwise if they're just hanging out, flying, uh, going into each other's hives, kind of spending calories without really getting much for it. Next slide, please. So that's where you can kickstart your bees into springtime with that uh, cover crop. So that's why we created the Seeds for Bees program is to feed bees and increase the, the diverse diversity and the quantity of pollen availability out there at a critical time before, during, and after pollination. Those colonies can, can stay on site for, for a while after pollination. So they also have something to forage on and uh, it'll kind of keep them in place too. It'll help with the soil and it helps educate and assist. And this is why we value the, the almond board so much is they're helping us get more growers on board and helping a grower figure out for themselves what type of cover crops work best, when to plant and so forth. And it putting them through this kind of school, this Seeds for Bee school, this B plus scholarship, uh, they're gonna learn a lot more what they should need for their site than I'll ever be able to tell them at least initially. So it's kind of this learning process that we, we go through together. Next slide, please. And in addition uh, to just general bee health and, and bee vitality for pollination, there is a lot of benefits to the soil. Cover crops help reduce ground cracking. They help, they can actually help with the decomposition of mummy nuts. If you're doing something like brassicas, they'll help suppress nematodes. There's something growing there and out in, in, in competing the weeds, it does help suppress weeds with very good control with weeds. If you're doing a legume, it can help nitrogen. Uh, water infiltration, compacted soils is the number one reason these the growers report to us that they try a cover crop. So there's a lot of compacted soils out there. Those roots penetrate the soil and they really help the, the rain get where it needs to go. Prevents erosion. Next slide, please. And it can increase organic matter as well. 1% organic matter in your soil is holding 19,000 gallons of water. It is hard to increase organic matter, uh, but it's, it is impossible if you're not, if you're not trying, but uh, plant and cover crops. Next slide, please. So the Seeds for Bees program, you have the option of a, a couple of different seed options. You don't have to pick just one. The first year you sign up, you're eligible for $2,000 worth of seed. And the second year you sign up does not have to be subsequent years. Uh, it, you get $1,000 worth of free seed. You get access to discounted pricing. Any grower that signs up any year, even if they're past the two years, they get free shipping. And they get free technical advice from me and support. I mean, you can call me as many times as you want. Um, I do site visits. Uh, you know, I'm really here to help you uh, figure things out and spread my knowledge. Next slide, please. Um, so the guidelines, 
uh, pretty easy. You must reside in California, complete that online application, uh, grow honeybee pollinated crops, obviously, like something like almonds. If you don't, that's okay too, but we kind of want to know a little bit more about if you're not renting bees, you know, what are you doing to help them out and kind of what's your, your, your outlook for your operation and then submit photos, complete a survey. And, um, you know, what the last step is a phone consultation. Next slide, please. I'll, I'll talk about that a little more. So there's a photo of our mustard mix. This is the one that's going to bloom nice and early if planted uh, first couple of weeks of October, either irrigated or if we get October rains, it'll bring it up in, in, I mean, this can bloom as, as early as late December, probably more like mid to late January. Next slide, please. The next photo is our 100% legume clover mix. So this is going to bloom probably not even before March 1st. So after uh, the majority of bloom is over, uh, much more lower stature, less uh, biomass, but really good at fixing nitrogen, controlling erosion. Next slide, please. Last year, we developed a soil builder mix. It kind of does a little bit of both. It's got some brassicas like the mustard mix, some grains, and uh, some legumes. Next slide, please. There's a, another photo of the soil builder mix. Um, yeah, so it kind of uh, shows you these the, the different timing of how these look before, during, and after bloom. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm doing on time. Feel free to jump in. Um, and this is just a photo of some of the different methods. Now, drill planting is very effective, but that's those are sometimes a considerable cost. So this person in series, they uh, just modified their ATV with a broadcast seeder on the front. You can see those flaps help keep it off the berms and in the middles. And then on the back of that same ATV, there's just a piece of uh, 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 kind of fence to help drag some soil over that seed. As you can see, it's a very loose soil. Next slide, please. So uh, you, you don't really need to work up the ground very much. And this is that same exact site. So they uh, planted the mustard mix. So you, you don't necessarily need fancy equipment broadcasting will work fine, I would suggest if you are going to broadcast, you know, make sure you, you talk to me and there's a little bit more of a learning curve. So next slide. And this is another grower. I believe that he also did the mustard mix. Again, doesn't have to be high tech. That's just an ant bait spreader. Um, and it, you now you get a lot of soil health benefits if you do plant it in the orchard, but you don't necessarily have to. Next slide. This person um, planted it right outside the orchard. Don't worry, the bees will find it. It's right there and, and it, and it worked, worked really well for them. Next slide. So a little bit about the research. Um, some of the folks that are uh, involved in some ongoing, really, really informative, great research uh, from the UC system that the Almond Board is, is funding. Next slide. And these, these studies aren't done. The paper still need to have to be written, but they're kind enough to share some preliminary results. Uh, the nitrogen that some legume mixes are, are, are able to provide, it's, there's a gradient depending on where you are, but right around 100 pounds the acre, um, which is nice to see. Yield. Um, we were all surprised to, to find it in very, you know, very quickly, there was a benefit to the yield. Um, Amelie Gaudin, one of the, the researchers, you know, she says rubber crops are a long-term investment, just like your trees. You know, so I was talking earlier about organic matter. You're not going to experience a, an additional 1% organic matter after one or two years of trying this. It's really something that's more long-term, but even in the short term, you, you can see uh, a bump in yield, um, another good way to think about it is just that there's there's no there's no harm to the yield at all. In fact, it it might help. Frost also, um, that's a big concern. So what they did was they studied 
different air temperatures right at the ground. I think it maybe six inches, a foot, three feet, five feet. And they showed that once you get into up into that canopy, there was really no difference in the air temperature compared a orchard with a cover crop in an orchard without a cover crop. So frost does not pose uh, any significant risk. At least that's what this research is, is finding out. Next slide, please. And, you know, I just want to tell you guys that this is a program that's supposed to help you out and supposed to work for you. Uh, please be as accurate as you can when filling out that survey. But um, that phone consultation you have with me is the last step. And that's when we figure out everything. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you didn't quite understand something. Maybe you, during the time you applied and we talked, you ended up changing your mind on something. Um, if, you know, if you're an almond grower, especially involved with CASP and the bee friendly farming and you get your application in time, uh, you, you will be accepted. And, uh, you know, tell me your issues. Tell me what you don't like. Tell me what you might like to see changed. I'm always here for you to, to help you out. There's, there are a few, there are a handful of ways to not do a cover crop, but there's so many more right ways to do it. Um, don't necessarily uh, get hung up on uh, anything that might, that might uh, scare you on the application or really just, I'm always open uh, to talk. Next slide, please. There's a, link to the application itself, feel free. I think the next slide even has my, my last slide has my email. So uh, email me before you apply, after you apply, always here to talk. Um, yeah, and thank you to the Almond Board and Sure Harvest and Pollinator Partnership for, for working together on this. Thank, thank you, Billy. Um, you know, the, um... I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the thing that I really found interesting, Billy and I did a, a talk earlier in the year in January, I think way back pre-COVID time, um, at Sutter High School. So Sutter High School um, has an orchard alongside their their school, and they wanted to do cover crop for all the, the, the reasons that Billy just went through. But they had a couple of other ones, uh, other reasons I thought were really unique and interesting, and it tells you the versatility of cover crop. So in the wintertime, they were getting runoff through that open bare orchard floor on the road outside the school, and they were getting complaints from the neighbors. So they did cover crop to help with that runoff, and it, it kept the water from running off the field and held it onto the orchard, which benefit the orchard long term, but it really helped from a public-facing perspective with their community. They also have dust issues because the school is in the town of Sutter. So they um, use full-coverage sprinklers and they keep their cover crop growing through the season. Um, and it really helped them reduce their dust laser later as they went into harvest. Um, so some different reasons. So it just tells the versatility. Um, and that's kind of the practical side. And with that, I'm, I'm interested to hear from, from Chris on, from the grower perspective, from the reality of doing this in the orchard, you know, this, these, we bring great ideas to you, but you had to live with it, right? And I'm really interested to hear um, your experience working with seeds for bees, working with cover crop, what led you into doing this and kind of how it worked for you, Chris. So I'll pass it off to you. I'm excited to hear from you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everybody, and happy Friday. Uh, my name, again, is Chris Rishwain. I am a third generation almond grower in Manteca, which is just south of Stockton. And we have about 150 acres of almonds. And uh, this is my second full year of using the cover crops. Uh, just to give you some background on myself and with the cover crops. Um, I first heard about the cover crops at a Blue Diamond almond grower meeting. And it just so happened that Billy Sink was giving a presentation that day and had never heard of it before and uh, gave a similar type of presentation on background of cover crops and the benefits. And uh, I found it very interesting. And uh, after that meeting, 
I decided to spend some time researching it more uh, just to learn more about it and uh, went to the Seeds for Bees website uh, as a starter and then from there looked at other online resources. There's quite a bit out there on it um, about cover crops. And so, uh, for example, Pacific Nut Magazine, I read about a grower, almond grower using it there and Blue Diamond and other publications just so happened to have articles about it just when I was looking around. So it was kind of nice to see uh, and hear or read about other growers experience. Um, so why did I decide to try cover crops? The original intent was for the bee pollination. Uh, I thought that that's a great idea. It seemed like a win-win for us and for the bees. And, uh, and so that was my initial intent and that still is today. Um, however, I looked at the other benefits and Billy mentioned quite a bit of them on the presentation that we could also uh, use as well in our orchard. And like he said, soil compaction was a, is still, but our major concern on our orchard. And I saw how different cover crops can really help alleviate that over time. So that became also like probably the top concern or benefit that I was looking at, but increasing the soil organic matter, uh, water retention, um, adding nitrogen free. <laughs> I like that idea. Uh, with the cover crops, they provide quite a bit. Certain ones do. Um, and I can say after two years, it definitely has reduced dust on our orchard. Uh, one of our orchards is a sandy loam soil, and there's quite a bit of dust on that orchard. And uh, just in two years, I've noticed uh, quite a bit of reduction because of the organic matter uh, that has been uh, added up over those two years. Um, and it also has, I've noticed, improved uh, habitat for beneficials out there. Uh, walking through the orchard, you know, I, I can spot them. And uh, it, it's just nice to see that that also is another win-win for us. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is some, uh, you know, my experiences with it, some things to consider um, and starting off, what cover crop do you choose? Uh, I didn't know where to go on that since I was new to the experience. And so um, first thing I did is, you know, after I determined my goals is I reached out to Billy Sink and uh, the Seeds for Bees program makes it very easy because they already have some pre-mixed varieties as he uh, shared with you today. So based on my goals and speaking with Billy, he, we were able to identify what I thought and he thought would work well for our orchard. Um, so that kind of takes a lot of the guessing work and time out of it when they already have some varieties made for you. Um, when to plant. So post-harvest, um, after we get a lot of our post-harvest management projects out of the way uh, is when I decided to plant. Ideally for me was mid-October. Um, that helps time the cover crop with the bloom, uh, which is uh, what our goal was. Um, the first year though, it took me a little bit longer to get it planted. I think it was more early November just because we had a lot to do on the orchard. And um, it was my first year doing the cover crop. So uh, it just took a little bit longer to, to uh, get that started. But this year I was able to get it done the second year, uh, mid-October. So that's kind of the goal. Um, uh, how did I plant it? Billy went over the two methods there, the broadcast and the drill method. I, I went with the drill method and uh, I, I thought, it just seems like that would uh, be a good way for us to go. Um, I hired somebody to do that. We didn't do it ourselves because we don't have a drill. Um, and one thing to note, the first year I only planted on half of the orchard. I didn't do the full orchard because I wanted to learn from the experience, kind of, you know, take it in steps. Uh, you could plant, you know, a quarter, a third, a half, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with. For me, that was half. And I wanted to also just compare that half with the other half that was not planted just to see if I notice any differences. Um, 
So this year, the second year, I planted the whole orchard. Um, irrigation, we have micro sprinklers, so we can't water the middles where the cover crop is. So we're at the mercy of uh, Mother Nature. This year, we didn't get rain until Thanksgiving, I believe. So uh, that delayed the uh, establishment of the cover crop. Um, but it turned out OK in the long run. Uh, but just some things to consider. You don't need to irrigate it um, if you can. That's good, too, though. Um, the cover crop, you know, one concern I had in my first year was, can I still perform orchard maintenance throughout the, the season, whether it's winter, uh, spring? Is it going to get in my way? Uh, any other issues that it may come up and uh, it did not uh, it was not a problem at all we still continued on with our orchard maintenance as we normally would um, didn't affect our tractor or anything else we just drive right over you know the tire marks uh, that part of the cover crop um, got driven over but the rest of it was fine uh, so it did not uh, get in our way at all so that's um, one consideration that uh, was not a problem for us. Um, this year, we decided to mow every other row in uh, the winter time for the mummies after we sh shook the trees. Uh, and that particular cover crop grows right back, so we didn't need to worry about it getting affected. And it, this year, it was already, at that time, it hadn't really established too high yet anyway. So. Um, uh, we just thought let's mow those rows for the mummies but as billy said you know the it, the cover crops can help uh, break those down naturally anyway so you may not have to worry about mowing that's just a, a decision that you can consider um, and terminating the crop how do you do that um, well we mowed our cover crop uh, you can also spray it if you want to uh, to bring it down. Uh, we did not, we didn't need to. Um, so you can also mow it and then incorporate it into the soil if you'd like. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but we may do that at some point. But at this point, we're just mowing it um, probably around late April, early May. And uh, one thing to keep in mind though with that is after you mow it, uh, when it comes time to harvest, there may still be some uh, of that debris, organic matter on the orchard floor. Um, what we've used is a conditioner during harvest to filter a lot of that out um, so that it doesn't get in the way of our uh, sweeping and harvesting of the almonds. Um, so that may be something you need to look at. We didn't use the conditioner the first year and, and it was okay, but it just that's one thing that really helped uh, get things harvested a little bit faster um, when we use that. Uh, costs, well, as been, you know, spoken before, the seeds for us, to give you a uh, idea of the cost, I mean, it was free for us, um, well, and for you too, but um, so the seed part, you know, there's zero cost. Uh, to plant the seed, uh, we hired somebody, as I mentioned before, uh, that cost for us about $15 an acre. Uh, that's gross acreage. They'll probably, in our case, the uh, company charges by the amount planted. So in our case, we don't plant the whole orchard. Uh, the rows make up about 60% of the acreage. So he uh, charged us by that amount. Uh, which would be higher. It would be um, like around closer to $22 an acre. But when you think about it just from a gross acreage cost, it was about $15 an acre to hire somebody to do that for us. Um, and the termination costs, we're already mowing our floors anyway, so there was no additional cost to terminate the cover crop. Um, some final thoughts uh, after... Uh, two years of going through the program, I'm a huge believer in cover crops now. Um, just so many positives and uh, the cost is very minimal uh, for us just hiring somebody to plant it. 
Um, it's provided, it's definitely helped with our soil compaction uh, going into two years now. And I know that's a long-term project. That's not something that will be fixed overnight, but it has definitely gotten the ball rolling on that and, and loosened up the soil. I see the improvement uh, definitely during pollination. We get a lot of bees. Um, it, it's been great to see that and provide uh, more uh, habitat. Our bee company is very happy with it. He said the hive strength is phenomenal and the pollen accumulation has been really good. So uh, on that end, you know, we're seeing some good results. Um, application, it's easy. Uh, the Seeds for Bees program, it's quick, it's easy. Uh, there really isn't too much involved. So I wouldn't let that be a, um, an issue like maybe some other programs are. The application process can be quite involved. This is not. So uh, that was nice to see. Um, I would just say, you know, if you have questions after this, definitely talk to Billy. Uh, wealth of knowledge and uh, can help you tailor a program for you. Uh, the Almond Board as well, obviously, there are tons of information there. Um, one book I'd recommend is called that helped me at least learn more about cover crops and answer a lot of questions and just get more comfortable with it. It's called uh, Managing Cover Crops Profitably, the third edition. Um, Managing Cover Crops Profitably, that was just a very good resource, kind of an all-in-one place as well to answer questions and um, give some good ideas about uh, the different kinds of cover crops out there. Uh, the internet as well, uh, lots of information there. And if you know any growers, just talk to them and get their experience as well. Uh, that's, for me, was another good resource. And uh, one last thing is, there are some cover crop field demonstration days uh, throughout the year, usually like a fall and uh, spring is when they have them. Uh, I went to one at the USDA NRCS in Lockford, which is by Lodi, but they have uh, different demonstrations throughout the region. So just keep your eyes out for that. You can see them and see what they look like, answer uh they have experts there to help answer some questions and uh, just kind of give you a good idea of what you may be, uh, what your orchard will look like uh, with it. So uh, that's about it. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, well, well, we'll open it up for questions um, for, for all the talks. I had, a, I had a couple of questions to start off though. Um, Chris, what kind of feedback did you get from neighbors? Did you get feedback from any of your neighbors on it? You know, I did not. I don't see them that often. Um, so it's we don't get the opportunity to bump into each other too much and uh, talk about things. So um, I did not. Um, but I do. One orchard that we have is right off a major street. And I do see occasionally cars, you know, parked there looking at the cover crop um, when we had it. But uh, yeah, nothing from our neighbors particularly. Yeah, they can be kind of photo magnets, I've noticed. Um, the public likes photos of, of orchards in bloom with great cover crop. Um, you, you talked about drill seeding. What kind of lead time do you need to kind of plan that out? You had to get a, somebody come in and do that. Um, what kind of lead time is involved in that? I reached out about a month ahead of time okay. just to um, get information about how they do it and talk with them and, and get their schedule because come October, they get busy because that's when a lot of people are planting their cover crops. So uh, I would say at least a month out just to try to schedule, get you know in their schedule um, and and just ask questions and have them come out and visit your, your orchard so they can take a look and, and really uh, uh, see if there's any potential issues they need to look at, but typically there aren't. So I'd say about a good month. And then the seeds for bees, are, are the seeds being delivered directly to you? Um, so yes. they're there, okay, okay. That's great. another great thing about the program is they deliver it to you as well uh, for free. And it, it's, it just makes it that much easier. 
Yeah, great. Well, well, thank you. So um, let's open it up if you have questions. The chat windows, um, you can just click that little icon and put a question in, and one of us will kind of review those questions. We'll give everybody a moment to do that. Um, another question for Billy. Um, if growers have participated in Seeds for Bees before with you directly, um, are they still eligible for the almond board um, incentives? You mean if they've signed up previously? Yeah, yeah, if they've signed up previously. Um, you know what? I'm actually not completely sure on that. Did you that? Yeah, maybe certainly. Joe's that. Yeah, if this is their second year, uh, I think we would certainly support that. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Because, you know, this, I really encourage everybody, um, the people on this call are some of the first to know. Um, this um, scholarship program is a great program to take advantage of. I mean, who doesn't like $2,000 of seed? That's a lot of seed. Um, so I really encourage everybody to jump in. Um, yeah. Sorry, Tom, yeah. for not having a clear answer on that, but I, the Almond Board is is supporting us in a way where they're trying to uh, make sure that there's something for everyone. So I, yeah. I you know, we'll, we'll get you taken care of. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why we're a team. Um, yeah. And then um, um, a question from Josette came up here. I see for Isaac, how does a grower get the coupon code for the free registration? Yeah, so uh, the Almond Board is going to be selecting the growers that they're going to sponsor, and then uh, they will be able to get the coupon code to those growers. So Pollinator Partnership will supply the coupon codes um, for the Almond Board. Okay, excellent, excellent. And any other questions from anyone? We have a quiet crew this morning. I've got a question for Chris. Yes, go ahead, David. Uh, Chris, uh, for us growers that plan on planting cover crops, I've done every other row of stuff, but this year I'm going to plan on doing the whole orchard. Do you have any experience with heavy prunings and going through with the mechanical mowers or chippers when you have cover crops established, how do they come through that type of disruption? Well, we did the pruning as well, um, you know, during the downtime and the cover crop at that time, I think it was probably December, can't remember exactly what month, but it was post harvest and, uh, kind of the slower time and the cover crop had not really grown much yet by then. So we just go through with our machines and um, we uh, we chipped, had it go right on top of the where the cover crop was, all the material and it grew just fine. Uh, we didn't have any uh, problem with the cover crop go growing uh, through the chipped wood that was in the middles. And I Did just wanted to say, question. yeah, so I was just curious if the cover crop had grown up, say, substantially high a foot or, or more at that time, depending on what you planted, if that green matter would bog up the machines or maybe not allow the, the brush to be chipped quite as efficiently. You know, by that time, it was not that high. It was probably... It was less than a foot, um, if that, you know, it was, it, and again, this year we had a delayed start because we didn't have any rains for until November, but the year before we had the same, uh, I think it had grown taller, but it did not get in the way. I mean, we didn't have any uh, problem with either the chipping machine, the pruning, um, or the cover crop uh, growing through all of that uh, material. Thank you. And I just want to throw in that, you know, we know that you guys 
are growing almonds. You, you care about bees, you care about soil health, you care about cover crops, but that's not why you're in business. Um, again, this is supposed to help you out. So if you were planting every other row and, and put your, your prunings in, or plant every row and put your prunings in every other row, um, if you do have a very cold season and you're worried about frost and you mow it down earlier than you know the, IB, the bees had a chance to access it, all those different types of scenarios, that's totally okay. That's not going to disqualify you. That's not going to get, uh, you know, upset me. We just want you guys to, to plan it and get it the feel for it. Great. Thank you, Billy. Any, any other questions? So I'll kind of cover this, um, as we have some more questions come in. Um, this is, you guys are it in early on this so it gets for the first 100 growers the the b plus scholarship um participation and cast but really it's it's very straightforward once you jump in but you've got a whole team behind you to support that you can contact um either myself or ashley career from the field outreach team by sending an email to field outreach at almondboard.com um and we're really we're the boots on the ground. We like to be in the in the field. So um, please use us as much as you want. Um, and if you need help with other things as well, as far as like getting connected with your farm advisor or questions on on a practice in the field, you want to learn about the Almond Orchard 2025 goal, something like that. Um, participation in this if we're gonna we're gonna cover the cost for the be friendly farming registration and get you a farm sign and then up to two thousand dollars of a free cover crop um, um so so that's for the first hundred growers so please please jump on board and, and give it a try um for casp if you go to sustainable almond um you can get more information on casp and sign up for casp um so and we'll, uh, I'll give you another shot for questions if there's any additional questions. Okay, and in closing, if Josette has anything that she'd like to add, um, feel free. No, just really hope that you, um, as Tom said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the Almond Board. And uh, there were also some great uh, folks here Billy Sink, Isaac, and Eric, uh, who are here to help you as well. So we hope that um, this was a valuable way to understand the opportunity. And again, I can't stress enough that um, we'll take some of the risk off your back for trying something new. So please take advantage of that. Um, and hopefully that will pay off for you both in terms of the benefits to the orchard, which Chris outlined so well, as well as um, potentially some recognition in the marketplace that the Bee Friendly Farming Program offers up. So hopefully a win-win all around and reduced risk. So we hope we'll hear from you and have a great rest of the day. Yeah, and thanks everybody, especially this time of COVID. I know everybody's probably um, webinar and Zoom call um, tired. Um, I know we've been on a lot of them, so I really appreciate everybody taking um, some time out in the morning to do it. I really want to thank the speakers. This is a team effort, and um, thank you very much for putting together your presentations and the time that you shared uh, with the industry. This is really important, um, and, and I hope everybody has a great Friday. Again, reach out, field outreach dot, field outreach at almondboard.com. would love to help. So with that, I'll say thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you a all. Quick, Happy Friday. A quick tip I forgot to add. We This was recorded, so um, we'll have it on the Almond Board YouTube page. So if you go to um, YouTube and search um, Almond Board of California, um, it'll be posted in our YouTube feed. So if you want to go back and catch something, um, we'll have it available for you.